Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this virtual fireside chat on defense, survival, and fiction, implications of COVID-19. I'm Barry Pavel and I'm director of the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security here at the Atlantic Council and a senior vice president. I'm very pleased to welcome two distinguished voices to our conversation today, Max Brooks, best-selling author of World War Z, and Kathleen McGinnis, author of The Heart of War, Misadventures in the Pentagon. And both are non-resident senior fellows here at the Atlantic Council. Thank you both for joining us and thanks to our audience for tuning in virtually. The coronavirus era is upon us and we have all begun to adapt much of how we go about our lives, our home life, our work life, our regional and local lives, and much more. While we do not yet know what this pandemic portends for national security, its already profound impact ensures that national security and defense will assume new meanings in its wake. The virus is not a geopolitical actor. It cannot be deterred, but it is a profound security threat against which we require a formidable defense as well as resilience. Here at the, here at the Council Scowcroft Center, we focus on practical solutions for countering the security challenges of today and those of tomorrow. And in honor of General Brent Scowcroft's legendary career of public service, our mission is to develop nonpartisan strategies to robustly address threats such as this, and doing so most effectively by helping the United States to work extremely closely with US allies and partners all over the world. This cannot be handled well alone. In this moment of uncertainty, we seek lessons from a variety of different domains, including history, other countries, and the subject of today's discussion, fiction and storytelling. While perhaps unorthodox, fiction offers a wealth of themes that can be applicable to the current fight against COVID-19, including disaster preparedness, pandemic prevention and mitigation, and the weapon, weaponization of fears. When I was a, a senior strategic planner in the Defense Department and the National Security Council staff, my main job was to look to the future and try to help prepare the United States for what was coming. That job required me to use imagination to understand the possible, and that's why even then I engaged people in the creative community. They helped me see what might be coming. In that spirit, we have two authors with us today who use their own works of fiction to communicate complex national security issues to broader audiences. We will begin today with keynote remarks by Mr. Max Brooks. His fiction raises awareness on issues of disaster preparedness, crisis management, and survival for his readers, all under the guise of the zombie apocalypse and other themes. His New York Times bestseller, World War Z, an Oral History of the Zombie War, one of my favorite books, was made into a motion picture starring Brad Pitt. And his latest book coming out this May is called Devolution. Max, we look forward to your remarks. After Max's remarks, we will turn to Dr. Kathleen McGinnis to moderate the conversation. Kathleen is author of The Heart of War, Misadventures in the Pentagon. She was previously a research consultant at Chatham House in London, working on NATO issues, and she served in the Office of the Secretary of Defense on NATO and Afghanistan issues and stability operations capabilities. Before I turn it over to Max, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is public and on the record. To our audience on Zoom, please do engage in the conversation by asking questions in the chat bar, and Kathleen will take as many questions as she can. Once again, I'd like to thank all of you for being with us for what I know will be a captivating and insightful and even inspirational conversation on the lessons of fiction for national defense and survival in the era of COVID-19. Over to you, Max. Thank you, Barry. Uh, and thank you for using that word unorthodox because uh, to me, the only thing that's unorthodox about using fiction to educate is that it's considered unorthodox at this specific place in this specific time. Uh, in the United States of America, in the halls of power in the second decade of the 21st century, it does seem unusual to 
look to storytellers in order to educate the public. But this is the only time and the only place that has been unusual. Throughout human history, we have always put our important lessons in stories. Uh, why? Because we are emotional beings and we need to be taken on a journey. We need to be enthralled. We need to be entertained. Uh, through this entertainment, good storytellers have also imparted wisdom. That is how societies have always educated their citizens. And no country was better at this than the United States of America. In World War II, the US government under Franklin Roosevelt jumped into the world of messaging by getting Hollywood on board and got all these great writers and actors and directors and said, listen, there's a lot that the public needs to understand because we are a republic and we can't do this without our citizenry. And there's so much that our citizens need to know. And if we just lecture to them, we're either gonna scare them away or we're gonna bore them to death. So do what you're doing, American storytellers. Keep telling stories. And while you're doing that, infuse it with the all important facts that the American voter and taxpayer needs to hear. That's one of the reasons that we won. It's one of the reasons that we were able to always maintain cultural superiority during the Cold War with the Soviet Union is because we were able to touch the souls of people all around the world and make them see why our cause was just. And then somewhere along the line, we lost that. We, we, we started to fall victim to a divide between the American people and those who protected them. And it started as a little crack in the 50s and it, it widened to the point now that there is a Grand Canyon-sized chasm between the sheep and the sheepdogs. And we cannot afford that chasm now. In an era of plague, of pandemic, uh, the citizenry needs to do its part. The average American, like me, needs to understand what we're up against. And we need to act as one. So how do we do that? We do that through stories. We, we tell tales where we touch the heart. And in doing so, we nourish the brain. That is why it is important to get fiction writers on board in order for our leaders to effectively lead us is going to be effective if you can't communicate it to the public. And this is a problem that we've been having for some time. Uh, it, it, I'm not going to bore you with, with the long history of the divorce between the United States population and the people who protect them, uh, but it is. It, it started as a little crack in the 50s. It has widened through the decades to a, a Grand Canyon-sized chasm between the sheep and the sheepdogs. Uh, and we saw this. We saw this in 9-11, specifically on 9-12, with President Bush's speech of, pray, hug your children, participate in the economy. That was a, a moment where our government suddenly admitted that they were afraid to ask the people for help, to serve, to sacrifice, to contribute, to interrupt their daily lives. And that was a huge, huge mistake. And it's a mistake we need to correct right now, especially with COVID-19. Uh, because a plague doesn't just attack the systems, it attacks everybody and everybody has to respond. So how do you do it? How do you, how do you take these complex ideas that you're all working on and communicate it to schmucks like me, the taxpayer, the voter? You tell them the story. You, you bring them on board. You get them excited in your story. You have characters trying to solve problems. You have a crisis. You have a resolution. Uh, you excite. You entertain. You enthrall. And while you're doing that, you educate without them even realizing it. You impart the education within the entertainment. That's the best way to do it. That's how we did it in World War II, and it was magnificently successful. That's how other countries do it now. Uh, that's how we, sh we need to do it right now. 
Because the problem is if you're just trying to impart facts to everyday folks like me, you're either going to bore us to death or you're going to put us to sleep. So entertain us. Uh, reach out to storytellers and get them on board. Educate them and let them educate the people. Uh, that's what we are going to talk about today is, is the role of stories in public education and, and why it is so critical to the health and safety of a republic. And I'm going to pass it on to Kathleen because she's smarter than I am. Go on. Well, I don't know about that, but uh, thank you so much, Max, for those uh, introductory remarks. Um, I, you're absolutely right. It, uh, you know, Karen Armstrong, actually a scholar of religion, reminds us that ever since we've been cavemen around a campfire, we have <clears throat> been using stories and narrative to, to teach each other fundamental truths about our world and who we want to be within it. Um, so it's, it's a powerful, deep connection that we have with storytelling that seems to be missing. Um, so, uh, but bef before I get into questions for you, I need to do a couple of housekeeping um, notes for this conversation. So I'm gonna take a break, and then get back to it. Um, uh, as Barry mentioned, I am a non-resident senior fellow uh, at the Atlantic Council, uh, but my day job is with the Congressional Research Service, um, where I'm a specialist in international security. Um, so to that end, I wanna make sure it's abundantly clear that any views I express during this conversation are mine alone. They're not those of the Congressional Research Service or the United States government or anybody at all besides me. Um, the other thing I wanted to make sure that you guys on Zoom are all aware of is that uh, you're able to submit questions through uh, the, the chat function on Zoom, which we're all becoming very acquainted with now. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, I'm going to, again, as I said, um, I'm going to speak for a couple minutes and then I'm going to pick Max's brain for a little bit. Um, and then I'm going to try to turn to questions from you guys. So start sending them in and, and, um, we'll get to them as we can. And we're going to try to wrap this up at around 550 or thereabouts. Um, so with all of that, uh, aside, um, I can't tell you all what an honor it is to be sitting here, you know, for this enormously important conversation. <clears throat> at an extremely critical time. Uh, the coronavirus is testing our readiness and resolve as, as a nation as well as globally. Uh, we are absolutely inundated right now with statistics about vulnerable populations and mortality rates and ventilators and masks and we're socially distanced at home if not sheltering in place. Uh, the communities that we national security wonks serve are scared. Frankly, so, so are we. And right now, what seems to be missing in all of this is, is context for understanding what we're facing. That's the context is missing. Now, as Barry mentioned, um, I, a couple of years ago, I published my own novel, The Heart of War, Misadventures in the Pentagon. And, you know, dovetailing a little bit on what you just said, Max, you know, from, from the, the national security practitioner's view, publishing a novel was terrifying to me. Um, in the world of national security policy, nonfiction reigns supreme. We, we study histories and think tank reports and other analyses, and, and, to, and we develop measures of effectiveness um, to guide our decisions. We don't write novels. And in fact, I, I've actually lost count of how many colleagues have come up to me and said, well, I don't read novels. I don't read fiction. That's, that's a, a frivolous thing to do. But Charles Hill up at Yale reminds us, um, and he's quoting him in um, this great book, Grand Strategies, uh, Literature, Statecraft, and World Order. Um, statecraft is protean. It's, it's incessantly assuming different forms and, and presenting new predicaments that are just beyond the ken of established methodologies. And he argues that literature and the arts give us this methodologically unbound way to creatively contemplate our circumstances. And according to this view um, from Charles Hill, we have been tackling an enormously challenging international strategic environment while at the same time limiting the tools with which we can understand our world and who we wanna be within it. So when I started writing The Heart of War Misadventures in the Pentagon, which started out as a nonfiction, by the way, I realized that actually it needed to be fiction. I needed a way to creatively explore the Pentagon bureaucracy and to understand what it all meant. 
I needed to help find a way for people outside the Pentagon to understand the sheer complexities of policymaking and the national security bureaucracy that we've built today. By walking a mile in these character shoes, maybe folks both within and outside the Beltway would have a better understanding of the personal and professional challenges that our practitioners face. And only fiction could let me do that. Um, which brings me to uh, Max. Uh, to me, it's again, it's um, World War Z was enormously important and inspiring to me as an author. Um, it, it brought together storytelling and creativity and fiction with the brass tacks facts of about warfare and pandemics. So again, thank you to the Atlantic Council for this extraordinary opportunity to, to, to pick a brain of a fellow author that I so deeply admire. Um, so again, for the audience on Zoom, uh, please start sending your questions on chat and uh, we will get to them in a couple minutes. Um, but my first question, Max, to you is the one that I know is on everybody's mind, right? Um, you recently made a short video uh, on stopping the spread of coronavirus, which I think has had how many views? Uh, I, th I think it's something like 15, 15 and a half million people so far have seen it, I think. 15, 15 and a half million people. Um, How's your dad? How's Carl Reiner and how's Dick Van Dyke? <laughs> we need well, to know. <laughs> as far as I know, uh, they're all fine. And, and this is exactly why I made the video, to make it personal. Because if you use dry facts and figures about uh, aged populations or the vulnerable or the immunocompromised, that means nothing. But if you make it about a father and a son, then people can identify with it. They can say, wait, I'm a son. I have a father. I don't want to get him sick. So I better make sure that I don't get sick. That's all you have to do with stories is you make them personal, connect to the heart, and then you've got the brain. Mm -hmm. So uh, shifting gears a little bit then, um, what are your thoughts on the roles that fiction right now can play in helping us understand this coronavirus pandemic? We can tell amazing stories and we can impart real facts in it. I mean, I can't tell you how many Americans probably right now know about the term social distancing from the movie Contagion. Because that was a well-made movie, but it was a realistic movie. It broke it down how a pandemic would really circle the globe. Uh, it talked about science. It talked about politics. It talked about geography. It talked about societies breaking down. But it was all real. Nothing, nothing was invented. And that was a great piece of education. And that's what we need to do now. So conversely, what are your thoughts on fiction's limitations right now. Um, so, um, for example, I notice in a lot of <clears throat> works and, and movies that writers, screenwriters, whoever, they, they tend to assume that leaders either have perfect information about what they're, they're facing and the environments and the risks and trade-offs, or they're, you know, Machiavellian sociopaths, or they're hopeless narcissists, and sometimes all three, which is also very interesting. Um, That's all. It, yeah, um, but has you mentioned in your opening remarks that there's this divorce, this chasm that's that has been widened. It's now a Grand Canyon size. Um, has have our storytellers been contributing to that? Yeah, part of it is that. Uh, part of it is is on the storytellers because well, part of it is the fact that the storytellers of the of the 1960s grew up in the 1940s. That's why 1960s science fiction was so good because they had all taken a role in history. It was the greatest generation writing science fiction. Uh, then you got to the baby boomers and it started to trickle out. It started, and so now you've got Gen Xers and millennials who have zero life experience. So part of it is just good old fashioned ignorance. They got nothing to say. Because also, because our societies have become so divorced, mm -hmm. uh, writers don't even come in contact with people who work in government. There's no more draft, nobody has served. Uh, we've become isolated. So writers write what they know. Uh, but there is also a creeping darkness coming from the East, which is, which is China trying to buy up Hollywood studios and promote Chinese soft power through their messaging. It's the same reason that World War Z was banned in China, because they didn't want a book that was critical of the Chinese government, even though it was a zombie story. They saw right through it. They understand soft power very, very well, and they're trying to use it to their advantage. So there is a reason now that my fellow screenwriters are not allowed to mention things like the Dalai Lama. No one's allowed to criticize China. I mean, remember Dalai Lama in the 1990s? He was the darling of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Where is he now? He, him and Vanilla Ice are living in a trailer somewhere. 
That is absolutely fascinating. And um, I think to a national security audience, I think people will find that a little bit frightening that writers are censoring themselves essentially um, to conform to Chinese narratives. Um, it, it, as a digression, have you seen much government involvement or interaction or, 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 or consternation about this out in Hollywood? Yeah, I, well, I've seen frustrated writers because they can't get anything anything done. I mean, I, I can tell you myself, I, I came up with an idea. I didn't come up with the idea, but I helped flesh out something called Great Wall, and it was fine. It was made by a Chinese uh, partnership, and it was, it was deeply apolitical. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can tell you that if you're a writer going into Hollywood and you have a Chinese story, anything that promotes Chinese government, they love that. And I can tell you that parts of Great Wall that I invented uh, were cut out. Certain parts of it were did not end up in the final movie because they were the tiniest bit critical of their government. Interesting. That is fascinating. Um, we can get shifting gears uh, further a little bit. Um, I'm curious, what is your philosophy when you're you're writing your characters, you're building your worlds? For example, when I was writing The Heart of War um, and having lived in the building, um, I developed what I call the Occam's razor of government. All things being equal, the stupidest explanation must be true. And that's why conspiracy theories are never, never on target. Um, what are the basic philosophical assumptions that you bring into the world building that, that you, you do? Adapt or die. It's, it's, that, it's that simple. Uh, it doesn't matter what I'm writing about. It's the same theme in every book I write. It could be about zombies. It could be about Minecraft. Uh, it could be about my new book, which is about Bigfoot. It doesn't matter. Uh, I write about individuals and I write about systems and countries faced with a challenge that will utterly destroy normal as they know it. So they can either adapt to a new normal yeah. or they can freeze in place and they can perish. And what does adaptation mean to you right now as we face the coronavirus? I think that, uh, and I don't, I don't want to sound jingoistic, but I do think the United States, uh, we have strengths and weaknesses. One of our weaknesses is we're always the last of the party. We always get sucker punched. But one of our strengths is our ability to adapt. Being a young country uh, where everybody, most people, not all, but most came from someplace else, we have a cultural subconscious narrative mm -hmm. that we can change because we're not rooted in a thousand years of history. Uh, we're the only country in the world where our last president could have been a slave of our former president, our first president. I dare any civilization through history to have gone that fast. Yeah. Americans can change. And if you look at America in any war, uh, in any crisis, we come them out of it on the other side. I personally lived through a plague as a Gen Xer uh, where my generation had to adapt. And we took the baby boomers notion of free love and we replaced it with safe sex. We changed an entire cultural narrative because we had to. And I'm proud to say that as a teenager, I did my part. by not getting <laughs> Excellent. We're good. Good. Glad to hear it. Um, <laughs> um, I wanted to turn to you, because you, you worked with the National Biodefense Commission um, to come up with uh, Germ Warfare, a very graphic novel, which I yeah. highly recommend to you, all of you out there on Zoom. It's fantastic, um, and it's, it's free. free on the website. You can download it for free. Yeah, and the art is really good, too. Um, really. So I was wondering, how did that collaboration come about? Well, this came about because uh, I was asked to sit uh, at one of their hearings uh, mm -hmm. on the Hill, the Blue Ribbon Commission on uh, Blue Ribbon Panel on Biodefense, and they had all these great experts: uh, doctors, scientists, intel experts, military, law enforcement, logisticians. But they were missing public outreach. Mm. There was no one on this panel, and this is what I made the point of telling them. I said, "You've got no one." to talk to the public and make them understand why this is important. Why would they vote for it? Why would they pay extra taxes for this? What does it mean to them personally? You have to reach out. So I was then recruited to write a comic book because I can tell you from experience, comic books are what people read. Definitely. So I thought that was the best way to communicate the idea that people have been using germs for thousands of years to kill people. And if we don't get ready, we could be on the receiving end of the next gen of germ attacks. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and what I'm, I'm gather from that, the, the you know the, the public outreach at that point from from the commission was was a bit of an afterthought until you brought that you know the, this role that we and I, I guess I'm linking that to my own thoughts about how we as Washington we 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 produce think tank reports for each other we we produce recommendations are very detailed <coughs> they do take things forward in important ways but we often fail to make that leap between what we've come up with and what we're telling each other and why the, and, and the public and, and communicating that to our publics. Yes, I think I think part of it is just uh, just cultural incest of just if you if you live and work <laughs> with the same type of people <laughs> for 20 years, this is just how you're going to think and this is how you're going to talk. But I, I, and part of it might be a little bit of snobbery. I mean, you know, we forget that the greatest communicators we've had tend to talk down. You know, Franklin Roosevelt sold Lend-Lease to the American public by saying, hey, if my if my neighbor's house catches on fire, I load up my garden hose, he puts the fire out so the fire doesn't catch onto my house. And then when the fire's out, he gives me the hose back. Boom, done, Lend-Lease, sold. So, but he was derided for that, for talking like a child, but it worked. And so I think we, we all need to get out of our heads and mix with other people of other disciplines to yeah. learn how to communicate better. Yeah, I know. The end of germ warfare, it gets into um, misinformation and disinformation when it comes to biological warfare and public <clears throat> health. Um, why did you need to feel to the, the need to put that theme in specifically? Well, I think we need to be very conscious of the fact that our enemies are masters at asymmetric conflict. And we are not. You know, we, we're still redoing Desert Storm over and over and over again, but we have pushed our enemies into asymmetry. So they are not just good at finding unconventional ways to kick us off the world stage. They're finding ways to integrate those ways. So you can't tell me right now that there aren't some very smart people in Drzezinski Square who are thinking about oh, basically turn us. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, good. <laughs> You can't tell me that there are, that there aren't enemies thinking about how to use coronavirus against us. They didn't attack us with germs, but they will seize this opportunity and they will use misinformation. We saw this already that Russian bots were trying to gin up anti-vaxxer debates yep. uh, just to get people uh, questioning vaccines for the eventual day a pandemic would come. Well, now that day has come. So we need to be very, very careful about who out there is going to use this crisis mm -hmm. to their advantage and against us. Well, and as part of that, I, um, I heard you mention this concept of, of information hygiene. I mean, what, what does that mean to you when, when, when yeah, what does that concept mean to you? Information hygiene, to me, goes back to the basic concept of common sense. Mm -hmm. uh, you have an organization that disseminates information. That organization then has to earn trust. It has to be truthful. It is truthful, we trust it, we depend on it. And then we put that in the category of people we trust. Then there are people we don't trust uh, who just pass along information. And we have to be very careful. We have to vet what's coming where. So if I have an article about coronavirus from the New York Times, I know enough about them to trust them. If I get it from the yoga dude down the street who tells me that I should then go onto Gwyneth Paltrow's site and put one of her healing crystals up an orifice, I go, <laughs> that is not yeah. reliable information. That right. is called information hygiene. <laughs> okay. Um, and I'm reminded of the, you know, the, the discussions we had and the capabilities that we had during the Cold War. We had the U.S. Information Agency. We had the Active Measures Working Group, and it was about... Um, ensuring that, that there was accurate information out there. It wasn't necessarily about putting information out there that was flattering to the United States. The, the calculation at the time was that accurate information builds credibility, and that's what we need in the longer term. Um, I'm going to turn to a question from the audience, which I think dovetails into our, what the conversation we've just been having. Uh, Jacinda Carroll asks us, how do liberal democracies develop effective narratives around the way authoritarian countries are communicating about this pandemic? Honestly, I, I think I think there's one simple way. We have to we have to build up our free press instead of tearing them down, because 
the, the governments of liberal democracies cannot just blame China because personally, look, we know the Chinese are hiding the facts. We know that. We know that they are not reporting accurately on sickness and death because they want to spin the narrative that their authoritarianism is winning the day. How do we combat that? Mm -hmm. We don't do this or you don't do this as, as people in government, but what you do is you tell the public to trust the free press. Mm -hmm. So if the press reports that the Chinese are hiding it, you then say, we trust them to report the news accurately. That is why in liberal democracies, we have a free press. And I know that governments and the press are always at odds, but they cannot attack each other's integrity as an institution. You can attack individuals and you can attack policies, but you cannot attack the institution's right and sacred duty to exist. Mm -hmm. uh, for all of you guys out there, um, uh, be sure to keep submitting your questions by chat and we'll be getting to them as we can. Um, Stephen Shapiro asks, the level of concern about coronavirus is political party dependent with 80, right, according to the <clears throat> question, 87% of Democrats and only 48% of Republicans are concerned about this outbreak. Um, Again, without knowing the sourcing, I think there is uh, questions about, you know, the, the extent of this is which this is a very serious concern. His question is really about how can storytelling overcome this new era of deep political division? Honestly, I think that that when you tell stories, you have to put your characters in positions to come together. Uh, if only half of the Republicans are not understanding that this is real. Well, that's on their leadership. Mm -hmm. And so there must be stories about brave Republicans who do the right thing. And those people must be elevated. They must be celebrated. That way they can inspire other Republicans. We need a wonderful story of the John McCain moment when he turned to that woman and said, you know, he's about Obama, he's an Arab. And he said, no, John McCain saved the day. We need those stories. We need the story of Colin Powell then following up and saying, what if he was an Arab? So what? Mm -hmm. you know, what? Something wrong with a little Muslim kid thinking I could be president of the United States? This is not Republican versus Democrat. This, this is about integrity either being celebrated or damned. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem because if you've got a Shakespeare that writes about Caesar and lionizes him, then forever you will have a dictator as opposed to if Shakespeare had changed Julius Caesar to Cicero. And then the Republican cause would have been championed. Hmm. Um, Ian Kurtzie asks, is there any effort underway to leverage Hollywood in the fight against COVID right now? Not, certainly not that I'm aware of, and certainly not in an organized fashion. Hmm. If I was in a position uh, of power, what I would do is I would have a central list of talking points that are vetted by the scientific experts, which would then be disseminated, not through the celebrities, not through the influencers, but through their managers and their agents, through their handlers to say, listen, here's what the public needs to know. So you need to tell the YouTuber who does the YouTube show of opening a box and saying, oh, what is inside? <laughs> they have to open them and say, oh, look, it's soap to wash your hands. That's how you have to do it. And it needs to come from the top disseminating to the bottom. Otherwise, you risk people having the right motives and just spontaneously making videos. But God forbid, what if they get the facts wrong? Right. So it's a whole of society almost effort to communicate the facts of these. Yes. Of the, 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 what the, we need is we need a central message like we did with AIDS, a mm -hmm. central message and a central messenger like we had with C. Everett Coop. C. Everett Coop one voice, one face, one message, which then disseminated down to celebrities. And then they could get the word out about safe sex. Mm -hmm. Now on this, this theme about Hollywood and um, uh, shifting gears again, back to World War Z, um, which by the way, for those of you who haven't read it, it's um, a very sophisticated, multi-leveled, multinational cut at these issues of warfare and pandemics. And you've got this fascinating character, this director who, who recognizes the urgent need for um, morale and confidence building and the, and the use of um, movies to, to, to do that. Um, where did you draw your inspiration for that character? Well, the, the inspiration 
uh, comes from old Hollywood, comes from the fact that when, when our country called, Hollywood answered. And directors and writers, they said, I'll keep doing what I'm doing, but this time I'll do it to help win the war. Now, this personal director is based on a real guy uh, who grew up with greatest generation parents, and he wanted to pick up the mantle of Hollywood's golden age. And so he took it upon himself to put out uh, hopeful narratives to get people's morale up. That's where the, the notion came from. Um, now, what would that director be doing right now res- regarding COVID-19? That director would be taking the scientific facts and putting them into PSAs, just rallying all his famous actor friends and getting them all to get the message out. Here's what you need to do. Here's how you need to slow the spread. Here's how you can do your part. Um, Back to the audience questions. Um, Steve Grunman is asking, um, what should we understand when we hear people use the term resilience? And and what should we be paying attention to in this crisis that that implicates resilience? Uh, we need we need to talk about adaptation when we talk about resilience because th- the problem is you can never be foolproof things things can get through however you need to make sure that you've done the work that when things do get through you're ready for them mm-hmm. and that's what Americans are very good at we have we've been planning for this we've been <laughs> planning for this. We're ready. Look, <laughs> lots of pages with words of people ready to go. Why aren't we going? That's <laughs> resilience. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and that sort of uh, reminds me of the, you know, the National Intelligence Council has the, its, you know, does its global trends report. And it's 2035 report, just looking at um, what it's predicting out now. It's it's pretty bang on the money thus far. Um it predicts that pandemics are, you know, as a result of the um, the, the proximity of humans to uh, animals and, and different um, different techniques in animal husbandry. <clears throat> that means pandemics are going to be here. That this is going to be something that we're going to be grappling. This is probably not the first pandemic that we are going to be grappling with as a country. So, um, as a globe, um, what do you think we need to learn as individuals? And as a country, to, to prepare ourselves for the next crisis, you know, God forbid. I think we need to re-examine our relationship to public health. And, and we become a victim of our own success. This is why we have anti-vaxxers around the world now, because we're three generations out from the massive plagues that used to kill and cripple so many of us. Uh, if this virus had hit us 20 years ago, there would have been enough of the greatest generation still left to smack us on the back of the heads and say, hey, this is serious. The problem is now even most of the grandparents today have grown up vaccinated. So you don't feel the fear of disease in the gut the way we used to. Uh, And it's easy to take it for granted. That's why we've been dismantling institutions in public health for years and cutting out uh, biosurveillance all around the world. We need to get back to that. This is unfortunately a brutal reminder that germs are here and they are not going away. And we need to treat public health the same way we treat national security because dismantling institutions of public health would be like cutting strategic air command on the eve of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, Another question from the audience, Um, CJ Horn asks, uh, I teach military war college students who sometimes lack creativity and openness. Besides our two wonderful books, you know, um, what other novels or movies would would you recommend for future national security leaders? Oh my God, Starship Troopers, number one. You got to do Starship Troopers because that that teaches about citizenry and that teaches about what it means to serve. Yeah. See, there you go. Oh, look, that's a nice one. Yeah, this one's a great one. Um, Max and I are both authors in it. Um, (laughs) <laughs> but it uses a Star Wars to teach about strategy and statecraft. Um, I, I would I would encourage, actually, I never thought I'd say this. I would encourage people to watch the Star Wars prequel movies. Yes. Because, yeah. Because, I mean, Lucas, he, de- he describes, he outlines the fall of a republic in yep. very scary and very real terms. So right? I would encourage that. I would encourage everyone to watch the TV show Babylon 5. 
uh, which has everything, geopolitics, science, technology, war, Star Trek, all of them are good. So Battle I Star would Galactica. encourage that. Mm. Battlestar Galactica. Uh, yeah. There is great, great creative science fiction that students of military doctrine should be watching right now. You know, and then the other one that um, I, I keep raising to every audience who will listen is um, Charles Hill's, um, as I mentioned in the opening, um, Grand Strategies, Literature, Statecraft, and World Order. And what he does, it's a fascinating project. He takes um, great works through the ages and, and uses them as a prism to understand key challenges of statecraft at the time and the key grand strategic themes that societies were facing. So, you know, Emma is a Jane Austen, you know, fun Jane Austen story, but to him, it's also a story, a parable about faulty intelligence, so on and so forth. So um, in terms of trying to teach how to explore um, explore these issues in a creative way, that I think it's a fascinating and wonderful guide to being able to do so. Um, let's see here. Uh, one more from the audience. Uh, Luke Chabro um, asks, will coronavirus lead to a backlash against globalization, globalism and trade, or will it lead to redundance and resiliency in supply chains, for instance? I don't see why it's not going to do both. I think, I think that there will, will be obviously a backlash. The backlash was already coming. The backlash was already here. It had been building for some time. We've yeah. seen these elections all around the world where uh, globalization caused a lot of winners, but a hell of a lot of losers, and the losers were forgotten. And the forgotten made damn sure that we didn't forget them by voting. Uh, so yeah, that's just going to speed it up. Mm -hmm. But I think this is where the government folks come in. The private sector can't wait to get back to normal. Their job is to make money. Good for them. They're supposed to do that. Your job in government is to make sure that they don't forget what has just happened. They have to be, they have to build in resilience because they're forced to. I'm sorry, but there's no other way. If the private sector was left to its own, my car would have no seatbelts, no airbags, no crash tests, no nothing. My home would have no mandated smoke alarms, no fire codes, no nothing. I would get on an airplane thinking, God, I hope it stays in the air because there's no one to inspect it to make sure it passes muster. Mm -hmm. This is the role of government. This is why we have government in order to allow the fire of commerce and capitalism to burn, but make sure it burns in a fireplace that keeps the house warm instead of in the middle of the floor and burning the house down. <laughs> yeah. um, D. West risks. Uh, asks, inherent in your assertion that storytelling can be used to inform the public is an assumption that expertise and experience is valued by both the public and politicians. Does the policy community, in your view, have a role in trying to address the lack of trust in experts that, that, that seems to exist <clears throat> in general public? Yes. Right now? Oh, anyway, God. What do do? <laughs> yeah. No. Look, first of all, we, we are reaping a bitter crop right now because we have been sowing seeds of doubt among experts if they didn't agree with our particular political agenda. We have demeaned them. We have degraded them. Uh, and this started in the 1960s on the left, where it was anti-government. Your government's not your friend. So, you know, don't trust the government. Don't trust anyone over 30. But then the right picked it up in the 1980s because they wanted to make money. And so they said, government's not the solution to our problems. Government is the problem. So you now have the left and the right chewing away at the center, and there's very little center left. And now look what's happening. People are dying, and a hell of a lot more people are going to die, unfortunately, before this is over, simply because we did not respect expertise. And if we learn anything about this, if the dead have not died in vain, is we will come out of this with a renewed respect for expertise. Um, Karine Rushanian, um, excuse me if I butchered that, um, asks, how can U.S. news organizations communicate best <clears throat> to foreign audiences about coronavirus and counter disinformation? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I think that, that you, you obviously, you, the news has to do what the news is supposed to do. Just tell the truth. It's that simple. And I say this to all news organizations. You have to risk being tuned out in order to tell the truth. I know you, every news organization, you want eyeballs, you want ratings, you want ad revenue. I know that we live in a capitalist news society, mm -hmm. but 
At this point, we all have to tell the truth, regardless of the price. Because if we don't, a lot of our fellow Americans are going to pay a hell of a lot higher price than lost ad revenue. So trying to bring some of these themes that we've discussed together, um, if you were world building, you know, a novel or a graphic novel in the post COVID-19 <clears throat> world, um, what assumptions would you bring into it? What, what would it look like to you? I don't, I don't like predicting the future uh, because nothing makes me cringe more when I, when I read other people's books who predicted the future and I go, Ooh, what? <laughs> wow. Uh, but I will say that my work in World War Z was just looking back at the past. And I will tell you that plagues come in cycles. And what happens is there's a plague, we're in denial, and then we tip over into panic, and then we get our act together, hopefully, before too many people die. And then we find a solution and we get through it. And then, unfortunately, we reach a point of forgetfulness. We have to be very, very careful not to reach that point of forgetfulness. I mean, I remember reading an article with, um, it was Harvey Firestein, mm -hmm. who said, so many of my dear friends died because of AIDS. And yeah. we did so much to try to protect our community. And now I see this next generation of young men just throwing their lives on the crap table, just forgetting everything they've been taught. And I think we need to take a page from that and make sure that when we bury our dead, when we heal our sick, when we try to put everything back together again, we must never forget what we went through. And, and yeah, avoiding that collective amnesia. And that's something, yeah, again, that storytelling can do for us by building empathy, by building, stories resonate, facts sort of t tend to dissipate. Yes. We must tell these stories of what the time, we must remember the journalists now must be authentic records keepers of what is happening now. So later the storytellers can properly communicate, educate and entertain future generations about the times we're living in now. So you are releasing Devolution on May 12th, in the middle of all of this. Maybe, maybe not, who knows? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, theoretically. Um, so, you know, without spoilers, um, are, are, what are some of the themes that, that, that you, you raise in Devolution that might be relevant to today's conversation? By the way, you can buy, you can pre-order your copy on his website, maxbrooks.com. Um, yeah, so it'd be interesting, you know, what are the themes that you've taken forward that might be resonant? Um, well, uh, you can judge for yourself if these themes are relevant because the story is about a group of uh, very highly educated, very highly paid, top of society, living in an idyllic community. And it's right in the Cascade Mountains, and it's an eco community, but it's a high end eco community. It's smart homes, solar panels, computerized. You tap your phone, a drone delivers your fresh same day delivery groceries. So you get all the comforts of the Upper East Side of Manhattan, but then you get to go for a walk in the woods and everything is perfect mm -hmm. until Mount Rainier erupts. Mm -hmm. And these people are completely cut off. Okay. And they have no plan and they have no emergency supplies. And these lovely, as I said, highly educated, highly paid intellectual David Sedaris fans have no idea how to change a light bulb. Okay. But they are completely caught unprepared. And I can say this because David's a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the worst, that is not the worst of their problems because as they scramble to try and feed themselves and fix these beautiful homes, something else is stirring in the woods that is also very hungry and has realized that it is coming up against a pen of sheep. <laughs> I can't wait to read it. Um, uh, so for you guys out there on Zoom, we're getting close to the end of our time. I think if it's okay with you, Max, we'll take um, like one to three more questions. Yes, please. Me. Yeah, that's why we're here. Bring them in. What do you want to know? Awesome. Okay. Um, let's see here. Kamal Unal asks, um, is a collective multinational response <clears throat> against uh, the virus, coronavirus, possible? Or will, in your view, each state try to deal with it individually? Um, oh, no, no. Oh, God. No, no. We have to deal with this all together. This has been the problem. We've been dealing with it country by country. And now in this country, we're dealing with it state by state. 
which, which is just suicidal because the virus doesn't care. The virus is not going to stay in New York. The virus did not stay in China. It didn't stay in Iran. This virus is global and we need a global response. We need to coordinate uh, information. We need to coordinate resources. We are, why is it that when, when times are good, we have a global supply chain, but suddenly in a crisis, we lock it all up. We need that global supply chain now more than ever. If we're going, and we're, and we're not just talking about manufacturing things, we need like masks and gloves. What about the raw materials? I have a whole chapter in World War Z about this, mm -hmm. about how do you have a supply chain that gets the raw materials to the right manufacturing base and then to the people that need them? That cannot be done just by the state of New York. That's got to be planet Earth. Yeah. Um, and it's just back to World War Z. I mean, it's just such a fascinating cut at, at how, I mean, maybe a little bit related to this question, but um, while, while a, a multinational global response is necessary, um, equally each country, each culture adapts and, 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 and grapples with the zombie threat differently. So recognizing that there's this tension there between how countries are going to execute versus how to do international coordination. I thought the book balanced that very, very well. Well, yes, you know, some countries in my book do better than others in the beginning because they're already uh, under siege. Mm -hmm. Places like uh, South Korea, Israel, I mean, even Cuba. Uh, these are countries that are always waiting for a threat. So when the threat comes, they're ready. Right. Uh, the United States is not ready, but as I say in the book, the United States adapts and ends up leading the way because we are such an amazingly adaptable people. Mm -hmm. And we will again. Yeah. I also thought that it was absolutely wonderful the way um, the, the the Chinese government in that scenario was was hiding the virus in plain sight and 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 the, the showing how again getting back to these questions of statecraft and how we do strategy like we don't have perfect intelligence the Iraq War tells us that, you know in two thousand three we don't have perfect intelligence and I thought that was really well brought uh, brought through in the the book. Um, well, you know, I think this is this is the difference in, in our two governments is the, the Chinese government must be perfect or else it cannot exist as an entity. Right. Our government can continue to function. We just kick out the people running the government. That's what's so wonderful about liberal democracies. And this is what uh, Jacinta, you asked me this. This is one of the things that we need to make sure our people understand. Our system can continue, but we can get rid of people running the system. We can throw the bums out without having to bring down the entire system because the system is not the people. The system exists as its own. Mm -hmm. um, sort of dovetailing on this a little bit, uh, Lexi Van Buskirk asks, uh, she says, China seems to provide a centralized, unified message in addressing COVID-19. And how can we provide an effective counter narrative without succumbing to the same moral pitfalls that Je Beijing has suffered from? All we have to do is tell the truth. It's that simple. All you have to do is have a single person, which is what we did. I, I encourage uh, the, the person who asked the question, just go back on YouTube and see the PSAs that C. Everett Koop did. And he did one with a very young, gorgeous Johnny Depp. And it was that simple. What they did was they took the science, they took the facts, and then they put those facts on television and said, here's where we are. And that's all you have to do. You don't have to hide anything. You don't need to manipulate. All you need to do is tell the truth. Well, one of the things that we were we we talked about earlier was you know the, the American capacity for um, for absorbing information and 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 absorbing the facts and and being willing to help, being being willing to do their part. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and this, is, this is what I find is so shameful in, in our leaders ever since 9-11. The American people, we are not children. We are not cowards. We are an incredibly tough and rough, ready people. We can handle it. Just tell us what we need to handle. We will do it. Americans are capable of incredible service and sacrifice and courage. And that did not go away with the greatest generation. That is sitting right here, waiting to be picked up and waved in the sun. So give us a chance. 
give the American people a chance to show what we're made of and we will make our country proud. Um, on that, so I guess a little bit adjacent to that, uh, Clementine Starling asks, what are the defense and security implications of pandemics such as coronavirus? Um, do you, oh. I mean, and if, I think the, the follow on question her, there is, do our security risks increase as our governments divert attention to domestic and internal crises? And I think this is something that the national security dorkery world yeah. We're, we're grappling with like the, the national defense strategy is silent on pandemics. It's all about strategic competition with right. Russia, China, and the rest of lesser threats. Things that go boom. No, yeah. no, no, this yeah. is, this is the problem. If I were an enemy learning and I wanted to kick America off the world stage, I'd hit us with a germ attack because I wouldn't have to hit our soldiers in the field. I would have to hit their families back home because you tried keeping unit cohesion in Korea or Europe or the Middle East when they know that their families are sick and dying. That's how you get America off the world stage. You hit them in the homeland and you do it with a germ attack. So in the short term, that's how pandemics can take us out as a world power. In the long term, it will depend on who recovers quickest and who is able to furnish aid and comfort to the countries in the middle. Because there's a hell of a lot of places in this world right now that can't help themselves. They just don't have the resources. And their people are gonna get sick and their people are gonna die. They're gonna need doctors, nurses, hospitals, medicine, and equipment. Mm -hmm. Now, is that aid going to have a red, white, and blue sticker on it? Or is it going to have the Chinese red banner? Because I guarantee you, whoever gets in there first with aid and comfort, is going to win a generation of goodwill. And we've heard this from our soldiers. I've heard this firsthand from soldiers in West Africa during the AIDS crisis. We got in there, we did what we had to do, and these soldiers have told me that the United States of America has bought itself a generation of goodwill in West Africa. If we need to get in there for any reason, the door is open. Wow. So we need to watch very carefully because if China gets into other parts of the world before us, we're done. You know, that's such a, an important point, especially for the, the Washington and, and I think a lot of academia uh, communities as well, you know, trained to think about hegemony and power in military terms. You know, that's, you know, that um, might equals right, those sorts of calculations. But, you know, Gramsci tells us that, you know, hegemony is based on like people have to decide that you're going to be the hegemon. You can't do this without the support of other people. It's a community decision. And um, that's how soft power leads into this as well. So I think that's a, that's a great way to sort of show this pandemic may end up having implications for um, global leadership and challenging our co conceptions of what power means in the international system. Well, just think about it this way. Think about it from a historical point of view. <clears throat> the, the reason we have bought ourselves a half century of peace and prosperity around the world is because the leaders running the world right now were children when our GIs came in, after we'd bombed them, after we'd, we'd fought their families. We came in with penicillin and with K-rations and we rebuilt their hospitals and their schools and their roads. And this has nothing to do with this. This is all here. Mm -hmm. When you're a child, you have an emotional response to kindness. And when Americans came in with kindness, we basically bought the world generations of freedom. And we need to think about this now. Absolutely. I mean, and then another thing that, that's, you know, dovetailing into that. So, for example, I grew up in, during the Cold War, I grew up in England. Um, we had at the height of the Cold War station in Europe at 400,000 troops. So, um, so you think about that, you think about families, you think that's like millions of people, millions of Americans living in European countries, working with, interacting with, having culture, you know, de facto cultural exchanges with their European counterparts. But after the end of the Cold War, we brought a lot of that infrastructure home. Um, what does that mean for transatlantic relations? <clears throat> no, this is, this, is, this is why, I mean, let's be honest. This is why Russia's our enemy now. I was in Russia in 1994 and I watched them collapse and they were waiting for a Marshall Plan and they never got it. And there was a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And Putin roared into that vacuum and said, I will keep you safe by keeping us strong. Mm -hmm. We lost Russia. Let's not make, let, we, <laughs> lost. we lost. And I'm telling you right now, 
when an African child is coughing with COVID-19, coughing nearly to death in a hospital, and she opens her eyes to see a doctor putting an oxygen mask that's going to save her life on her face, we need to ask ourselves, is that doctor going to be American or Chinese? Because that little girl is going to grow up to possibly become the next president of her country. Mm -hmm. Who is she going to, to know in her heart, in her gut, who is a friend? Um, and, and to close the conversation, because we're at 6 p.m., um, I that's a really great way to sort of bring us back to the big theme of our conversation today, which is the role of fiction, right? Fiction doesn't just help us predict or think about the future. It helps us build empathy with our fellow humans. It helps us walk a mile in their shoes. And um, so fiction is an enormously important tool for, for all of these reasons that we've had uh, discussed today. Max, thank you so much for your thoughts. We all very much appreciate it. This has been a delightful conversation, although the topic has been quite scary. Um, uh, thank you all uh, who've been uh, uh, participating and uh, tuning in through Zoom. Um, this, I think the recording of this is going to be available on YouTube a bit later. Um, but thank you so much, everybody, and have a great evening. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone.